Amishna Paraya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswata Devi Gauravani Prachadane Nurabhasesha Shunyavadi Pastakta Desha Tarane Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Si Advaita Gadadhar Shwasti Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this is the subject Shiksha and Diksha Gurus Simple Topic In the early days of ISKCON, Prabhupada would talk about spiritual master. And then they would think, okay, Prabhupada's guru, he's the guru like that. And there was no real distinction of shiksha and diksha, etc. And then uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita was published. And then this is where we start getting some distinction between shiksha guru and diksha guru, which no one, heard, no one had heard of that before. Uh, so, for instance, here we find in the first chapter of the Adi Lila, I first offer my respectful obeisance at the lotus feet of my initiating spiritual master, that's the uh, mantra guru, or the diksha guru, and all my instructing spiritual masters, the shiksha guru gun. Huh? And then we see initiating and instructing spiritual masters are equal and identical manifestations of Krishna, although they have different dealings. So all of the descriptions that we find for a Diksha Guru also apply to the Shikshu Guru in terms of being non-different from Krishna, etc. Huh? So this is a very what, absolute statement we see here. And it's not made once, it's made many times. Initiating spiritual masters, the personal manifestation of Shri Madana Mohan Vigraha, whereas the instructing spiritual master is a personal representative of Srila Govindadev Vigraha. So they're both representing Krishna in some aspect as Sambandha and Abhidhyaya. There's no difference between the shelter giving Supreme Lord and the initiating and instructing spiritual masters. If one foolishly discriminates between them, he commits an offense in the discharge of devotional service. And here we have a Definition, spiritual master who first gives information about spiritual life is called the Vatma Pradarshika Guru. The spiritual master who initiates according to regulations of Shastra is called the Diksha Guru. And the spiritual master who gives instructions for elevation is called the Shiksha Guru. So here we get another term, Vatma Pradarshika Guru, which literally means the guru who shows the path. So one of the persons who introduces you to Krishna consciousness is called the Vartma Pradarshak Guru. You can say he's also a Shiksha Guru. And then we have people who give instructions, and we have one who gives Diksha. So we have uh, three there. <laughs> there are two kinds of instructing spiritual masters. That Shiksha Guru is two types. One is a liberated person, fully absorbed in meditation and devotional service. The other is he who invokes the disciple's spiritual consciousness by means of relevant instructions. So one is giving instructions, one is in a very elevated platform who gives very elevated inspiration. Uh, Pata Pradarshik or Vartma Pradarshik Guru means the guru or the spiritual master who shows the way. Such a guru is sometimes called Shiksha Guru. Although Narada Muni was his Diksha Guru, the initiating spiritual master, that's for Dhruva, Suniti, his mother, was the first who gave him instruction on how to achieve the favor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is the duty of the Shiksha Guru or Diksha Guru to instruct the disciple in the right way and it depends on the disciple to execute the process. According to Shastra conjunctions, there's no difference between Shiksha Guru and Diksha Guru, and generally the Shiksha Guru later on becomes the Diksha Guru. So again, they're identical. And of course, the Shiksha Guru may become Diksha Guru also. Now uh, we find this interesting statement in the Bhakti Sandarbha of Jiva Goswami, you can say confirms or whatever was stated in Chaitanya Charitamrita. One accepts the Guru who teaches, as a Shiksha Guru, the method of worship, Bhajana Vidhi, who was the previous Shravana Guru. So we get a, a Shravana Guru, like a Vartma Pradasha Guru, an initial Guru who gives the initial instructions. You get a Shiksha Guru, gives more detailed instructions. Now, since one has already obtained such a qualified person in the form of a Shravana Guru, one has many Shravana Gurus, one among uh, them, one may accept one of them as a Shiksha Guru to whom one has great attraction. So uh, we can say the Shiksha Guru is a more 
special or uh, person to whom one has more attraction, even though they're all Shikshu Gurus. Similarly, selecting a person to whom one is attracted, a person takes only one person as a mantra guru, since many mantra gurus are forbidden. So you can only have one Dikshu Guru, you can have many Shikshu Gurus, and among those Shikshu Gurus, you may take one as a very prominent person. The Shravana Guru, from whom one gets faith either uh, with Vichar, which means more philosophical or ruchi taste, and the Bhajana Shikshu Guru, from whom one learns worship, are generally the same person. So, um, concerning gurus, uh, we in ISKCON generally we say, okay, the spiritual master, you should worship the spiritual master as if he were God. So normally people take that as referring to the Diksha Guru. But, as we saw from Chaitanya Shatamarta, Shikshu Guru and Diksha Guru should be treated equally. So we have to give them both that similar respect as being non-different from God. So it's not one person, but two persons, or maybe more, that you're treating like God. <laughs> huh? And if we look at the many of the quotations uh, that tell us how to respect the guru, uh, they're actually referring to Shikshu Guru, not Diksha Guru. So we have many statements from the Upanishads, which are often quoted. Tad Vigyanartam Sagurum Eva Bhigachet. We'll find that quoted by Prabhupada in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Bhagavatam several times. Huh? So this is actually from the Mundaka Upanishad. So in the uh, Vedic tradition, when they were teaching Vidya or Jnana or whatever about Brahman, uh, the Diksha Guru for the Vedas was actually the father, because he gives you the Gayatri Mantra. Then they go to the Gurukul, and some teacher teaches them for five years, 10 years, or whatever, 20 years, or whatever. So the person who's giving the knowledge is generally the Shikshu Guru. And this is the one they're talking about, that, uh, which one should approach a Guru for knowledge. Uh, so this is the, actually a Shikshu Guru they're talking about here. Similarly, a Mundaka Upanishad Guru will teach Brahma Vidya in truth to the student who has completely surrendered, who has controlled his mind, has controlled his senses. By that knowledge, he will know the eternal, indestructible Lord. So it's all Shiksha here. A uh, famous verse from Svetasvatar Upanishad, Yasadeva Para Bhaktir, Yata Deve Tataguro. To the great Sulas, great Bhakti for the Lord and Guru, the meaning of what was spoken are revealed. So this is again Shiksha, not Diksha. <laughs> Acharya Van Purusha Veda. It's also quoted in Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam and other places. A person who is an Acharya knows that the Lord is here. This is again Shiksha, not Diksha. So many of the things that we quote for dik, we th assume as Diksha is actually for a Shikshu Guru. <laughs> and in Bhagavatam we have many quotations. Uh, Yasya Saksha Bhagavati, this one about a Guru who is to be treated directly as Bhagavan. Is this Shikshu or Diksha? <laughs> it could be both, it could be either. It doesn't say it's Diksha Guru or Shikshu Guru in that case. That's from seventh canto. But here is one from 11th canto. Acharya Mam Vijani Yam Navamanyate Karhi Chit. Now, this is also a famous verse which is often quoted. One should know the Acharya as myself and never disrespect him in any way. One should not envy him, thinking him to be an ordinary man, for he's a representative of all the demigods. So, this is actually instruction to a brahmachari. It's all talking about the brahmachari conduct, etc. So, the brahmachari treats the Shiksha Guru as non-different from the Supreme Lord, don't disrespect him at any time, don't think of him as a human being. And uh, Jiva Goswami's commentary, this is actually uh, seeing a guru who teaches karma, not bhakti, not even jnana. <laughs> He's uh, speaking within the Vardashan system, even the, the, the guru who teaches you karma yoga, you should be treated like God and don't disrespect him and see him as a material person. So therefore, these instructions about seeing the guru was God applied to Shikshu Guru, Dikshu Guru, and even a guru who's not a Vaishnava. <laughs> so, um, the Chaitanya Shachamana made a distinction between the Shikshu Guru and the Dikshu Guru. And it also said, okay, the Shikshu Guru teaches, and the Dikshu Guru is the Mantra Guru. But sometimes we have a little confusion about What's the mantra even? Is it Hare Krishna or what? Huh? So this is the 
Let me say the technical definition of diksha. Uh, first verse is quoted in the Upadesha Amrita and a few other places. Uh, second verse is not so often quoted, but it's found in the Bhakti Sandarbha along with the first verse. And uh, uh, Jiva Goswami gives an explanation of this verse when he talks about diksha. Yeah? So this verse actually is uh, quoted in many places, also quoted by the Ritviks <laughs> to support their theory that Prabhupada's the only diksha guru even. <laughs> so, diksha is so called by the wise because it dis- dis- bestows divyaganam, that is attaining Krishna, and destroys sin. So two things happen. So the, why these two elements are taken out to describe diksha. Huh? So the reason is because diksha has two syllables, di and sha. So di stands for diviganam, sha for sankshayam, papasya, destruction of sin. So therefore, these are two effects of diksha. So some people will therefore conclude, ah, therefore the diksha guru is superior to everyone else because he gives us transcendental knowledge, and destroys our sin. Nobody else knows that. So if you isolate this verse, then that could be the meaning. However, the second verse talks about how you surrender to Guru and Griniyad Vaishnava Mantram. Therefore, one should respect the Guru, offer him everything, and accept Vaishnava Mantra according to the rules while taking Diksha. So uh, Jiva Goswami explains this. What is the Divyaganam? Divyaganam is knowledge of the form of the Lord and knowledge of one's particular relationship with the Lord in that sacred mantra. So in other words, Diksha means getting a mantra, secret mantra, not Hare Krishna, which conveys form of the Lord and knowledge of one's relationship with the Lord. It's mainly for rich householders doing deity worship. Uh, so this is, he says this because this mantra is used for deity, it qualifies you for deity worship. If you don't have the mantra, you should not do deity worship. That's why we say that unless you have second initiation, you can't do deity worship. Because those are the mantras that's referred to here, the Krishna mantra, 18 syllable Krishna mantra. With that, you're qualified to worship Krishna in the, in the deity form. So in the sacred mantra. But we know, everybody knows, who's the form of the Lord that we worship? Krishna. Krishna. We already know that. (laughs) What's our relationship with him? Eternal Krishna Das. Of course, we could have Sakya, Ras, or whatever like that. Anyway, uh, all that's contained within the mantra here. But where else is it contained? Hare Krishna. But it's also in Hare Krishna, which is not Diksha at all. So we get the same thing, Divyaganam, and destruction of sin through Hare Krishna, not only through Diksha. So in other words, these two effects are not all exclusive to Diksha. In fact, not only with Hare Krishna, any type of bhakti will do that. Read Bhagavad Gita, you get Divyaganam, do you not? What do we get if we read Bhagavad Gita? Material knowledge? No, <laughs> we get divyaganam also. <laughs> and what does that do? Destroys our sins also. So we get many sources of this happening, not just diksha. Nevertheless, we have many quotations telling us you have to take diksha, you have to take diksha. If you don't take diksha, your life is ruined or whatever like this. <laughs> so Hari Bhaktivala also states this. Just as brahmanas who have not taken the sacred thread are not qualified for studying the Vedas or other duties and gain qualification for receiving the thread. Those who have not taken Diksha are not qualified for uttering the mantra or worshiping the deity. Therefore, should undergo Diksha and be praised by Shiva. So in other words, it's that you should take Diksha and this qualifies you to worship the deity. In other words, they're saying deity worship is bhakti and you can't do deity worship unless you got Diksha, so you must take Diksha. So it's related to deity worship. Again, another quote from Hari Bhakti Vilas. Unless one is initiated by bona fide spiritual master, all his devotional activities are useless. Anybody here hasn't taken initiation? 
Is everything useless? <laughs> no, we can't say that also. Uh, a person who is not properly initiated can descend again into the animal species. <laughs> so we have these rather extreme statements about praising Diksha. If you don't have Diksha, you go to hell or something like that. <laughs> but uh, we should take a little more, more mature understanding of such statements. Huh? So Diksha was basically for getting the deity mantra qualifying you for deity worship. Shiksha's teachings. Those are the special functions. And of course, then we get the uh, Diksha Guru also giving teachings, as well as giving the deity mantra. So, uh, when uh, Lord Chaitanya appeared, he introduced something new. Before that, for many people, the main per, uh, sadhana for advancement was deity worship. And therefore, there was an emphasis on deity worship and an emphasis on diksha. And that's why we have these statements. Uh, your life is useless unless you take diksha. Because there was no other process. Huh? But then, Orchitanya came and he introduced Nam Sankirtan as superior to any other process. In which case, diksha and arshana become less important. So therefore, we have, when we, we have these absolute statements about Diksha, uh, your life is useless, you don't make Diksha. We have to qualify that when we come to Lord Chaitanya and his movement and the chanting of Hare Krishna. Of course, in the Chaitanya Tartamara, we find that Diksha is not rejected also. So we find statements like Diksha Kale, Bhakta, Kore, Atma Samarpa. At the time of initiation, when a devotee fully surrenders under the service of the Lord, Krishna accepts him to be as good as himself. When the devotee's body is thus transformed into spiritual existence, the devotee in that transcendental body renders service to the lotus feet of the Lord. So it's a, it's a means of transforming your body into a spiritual body and serving the Lord. But with Lord Chaitanya, the, the, the main process is not deity worship or diksha <laughs> as a means of transforming your body into a spiritual body. It's Harinam. And this is emphasized over and over within the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And it's independent of Diksha. O best of the Brahmanas, even without diksha, initiation or Diksha, preliminary purification or acceptance of the renounced order, one can attain perfection in devotional service simply by chanting the Lord's holy name. Simply by chanting the holy name of Krishna, once a person is relieved from all the reactions of a sinful life, one can complete the nine processes of devotional service simply by chanting the holy name. So but one of the effects of Diksha was destruction of sin. Chanting the holy name once destroys all your sin. <laughs> one does not have to undergo initiation, Diksha, or execute the activities required before initiation. One simply has to vibrate the holy name with his lips. Thus, even a man of the lowest class, Chandala, can be delivered. So we have many emphatic statements saying that Harinam is independent of every other process, and that is enough to deliver us. Nevertheless, as I said, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not uh, reject Diksha, and we also don't reject that process. Uh, it is very important for Arshana, or deity worship. This is Pancharatra Kumar. But we also cannot reject chanting the holy name which doesn't require Diksha. This is called Bhagavata Mara. So generally we do the two things together. Uh, we do Harinam, but we don't reject other processes of Bhakti, including Archana. Yeah, so basically we have the two processes going on simultaneously. Why, Why we continue the deity worship? Uh, it's essential to reduce one's restlessness due to the contaminations of conditioned life. So many people, their eyes and their noses and their hands and their feet are all restless. They can't control them, anything. So deity worship gives a chance for them to engage their senses. Uh, so therefore, very useful for us. Uh, some people, of course, they just chant Hare Krishna. They, they can, are completely satisfied with that. Others need more engagement. So therefore, deity worship is recommended. So then why do we continue to uh, stress Diksha? even though Harinam is there. Uh, of course, we could say, well, Lord Chaitanya accepted Diksha also. It's a system there. And we also don't reject 
archana as a process. It's one of the five important angas of bhakti, so we continue with it. And we see that after Lord Chaitanya also, they established lines of teaching um, uh, through our we say, initiation lines, Advaita Charya. Uh, he was initiated, he initiated people after his descendants, his uh, bloodline, so to speak, they initiated people. That became Advaita Charya's Goswami line. Gadadhar has a line. Nityananda and his wife Janava and their son Virapachandra, they started one line. Srinivasacharya has a line. Shamananda has a line. Narada has a line. So we have many lines of Diksha coming down. Uh, many of who were Brahminical. Narada wasn't, uh, the other ones were in this line, were Brahminical. Uh, and it was hereditary also. Uh, so why the continuous stress on Diksha? One reason traditionally was that in these lines they also handed down Raghunuga Sadhana and what we call Siddha Pranali, getting your Manjari identity, etc. That was also carried on by the same gurus. Okay? So therefore, and that's also like the Diksha Mantra, it's a secret. So therefore you can only get your Manjari Sarup through the taking initiation and later getting the Sarup from the guru like that. So that's another reason why it was emphasized. So we got the Diksha Mantra plus the Raghunuga Shiksha as a speciality carried on by the Diksha Guru. <coughs> Of course, sometimes you could go to another Diksha Guru and get the Suru from him also, even if your Guru was someone else, in which case he would be a Shiksha Guru. In ISKCON, we don't have a Siddha Pranali line. <laughs> so basically, the Diksha Guru is Diksha Mantra and Shiksha only without the Raghunuga Sadhana or whatever in it. And we have the, uh, the Shiksha Guru giving Shiksha. Bhakis and Saraswati Thakur, he rejected these. Uh, oops, where, where is the lines there? Okay, whatever. Anyway, he rejected those traditional lines, <laughs> which are Goswami lines, Kurnikari lines of Diksha. Even though Gorkishore's line could be traced to Advaita Charya, Bhakti Vinod's line could be traced to Janava, up that way. He ignored all those Diksha lines completely, and he simply traced the Shiksha line. Again, he de-emphasized the Diksha aspect, and the mantra being, you know, so important. So he traced the Shiksha line only. And he also, uh, his conduct is stated here, to some disciples he never awarded Diksha, that means those deity mantras, deeming Harinam alone sufficient for the spiritual progress. And he stated, the success of Diksha is inclination for Harinam. Whoever remains fixed in chanting inoffensively should be understood to have undergone diksha and all the proceedings. He chanted Hare Krishna nicely, that's diksha. <laughs> so, you know, he shifted the emphasis to gain upon chanting the holy name and shiksha instead. And another quote the diksha, the person who is initiated with diksha mantra, is inferior to. Harinam Asrita, one who has taken shelter of the holy name. So he's giving prominence to the person who chants Hare Krishna over the one who has deity mantras. For those who don't believe the name and the name, that is Krishna and the name of Krishna are not different, for them deity worship is required. But when we, when we understand that the, the tattva of the name, the name is not different from Krishna, that would, that's sufficient for us. That's what he states here. In spite of that, in the Gaudiya at present, and in Iskhan, we still emphasize Diksha over Shiksha, even though Chaitanya Chaitanya says they're equal. <laughs> still we, we do that. Uh, why? Okay. One reason, of course, is we have very elaborate ceremonies attached to Diksha. And we can say more elaborate than at any point in the Gaudiya line. Our ceremonies are much more elaborate. We have uh, big sacrifices, fire sacrifices, and we have vows, chanting on beads, etc. Originally, a very simple ceremony. In the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, Gopu Kumar simply got mantra, not even a name. He only got a name when he saw Krishna later on in Goloka. <laughs> That's when he got a name. Before that, he was just chanting mantra. He only had Diksha without anything else. No fire sacrifice, nothing. No, no teachings even. 
And uh, in the Gaudiya Sampradaya, Lord Chaitanya got mantra. No ceremony, just getting the mantra again, and he got a name. So generally, uh, in the Gaudiya Sampradaya, when, let's say, Narutam gave initiation, or Janava gave initiation, they gave the mantra, secret mantra, and a name. That's all. No ceremony, really, no special ceremony. And that's continued in most of the Goswami lines, etc. But, as I said, Diksha and Shiksha become a little bit blurred, as uh, Bhakti Siddhartha says, there's Chani Hare Krishna, that's the real Diksha, or whatever. And Prabhupada also has statements like that. And even in Chaitanya Krishna, we find something like this. In other words, the spiritual master awakens a sleeping, living energy to his original consciousness, so that he can worship Lord Vishnu. This is the purpose of Diksha or initiation. Initiation means receiving pure knowledge of spiritual consciousness. So, it's more or less uh, not a, a ceremony as such. It's more the consciousness that you get. And Prabhupada says, if you've understood this Krishna conscious philosophy and you've decided that you will take Krishna consciousness seriously and preach the philosophy to others, that's your initiation. My touch is the formality. And then uh, chanting of Hare Krishna is our main business. That's real initiation. And as you are all following my instruction in the matter, the initiator is already there. Now the next initiation will be performed as a ceremony officially. Of course, that ceremony has value because the name, holy name, will be delivered to the student from the disciple concession. It's got value. So the, the actual ceremony, or what we call first initiation, is a ceremony. Not that we can do that, but even without that, if you're seriously checked, that's initiation. So initiation gets a very broad meaning. Why do you believe in rumors that first initiation is not so important as second? I've already said it's equally important. But you say rumor. Actually, first initiation is more important. You can go without the second initiation. So in other words, the mantra becomes less important again. Even though that's technically speaking initiation. If the first initiation is executed very thoroughly, that is sufficient. First initiation stands strong. But then he also says, regarding your question, second initiation is real initiation. First initiation is preliminary, just to make them prepared, just like primary and secondary education. So we've got a contrary statement here. So in other words, the whole idea of initiation becomes a little bit blurred. Uh, is it the mantra, or is it Hare Krishna, or is it this internal acceptance and uh, you know, practicing Krishna consciousness? We've got a variety of me uh, ambiguities surrounding this word diksha or initiation. Is it, and then we got to add the thing, Brahminical initiation, added to the lot. Uh, and we get the second initiation, we get first initiation, uh, we get diksha, shiksha, all these different terms going around. Uh, so, what is it? Internal acceptance, chanting Hare Krishna, first initiation, second initiation, Brahman initiation. Okay. So we often kind of call the whole thing initiation. <laughs> we can analyze it, historically speaking, like this. There's something called Puncha Samskar, five purgatory rites for initiation, which are practiced in uh, Pancharakra. Yeah. So one of them is Lak. Another is called Branding, where you take hot iron with a chakra and chakra on it, put it in the fire, get it hot, and stick it on your body like this, so you get branded. It's called Tama, which we don't do generally. They still do in South India. That's the second one. Third is getting a name like Krishna Das or uh, like a Dwarka Das or whatever, <laughs> Tulsi Das, etc. Uh, fourth one is getting the Krishna Mantra, which is the essential thing. If you don't get that, it's not called Diksha. And the fifth one is called Yaga or deity worship. You're qualified for deity worship or instructions on deity worship. These are called the five elements of Pancha Samskara, which constitute initiation. Of course, as I said, if you get the mantra, there. That's actually initiation. If you don't have it, it's not considered initiation, but these five elements are also included. So what happens is um, the Gaudiya Mat, under Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, uh, they have this as initiation, getting a mantra, and qualification for deity worship. But they had another ceremony called giving the name, Nam Dan, 
in which you're allowed to wear the tilak and you get some beads and you get a name maybe like Krishna Das or something like that. Not necessarily from the person who becomes a Diksha Guru. Either. So this was not called initiation. It's getting the name. And a name does not require initiation. In other words, Chang Hari Krishna, we chant 16 rounds to get initiated. So it doesn't, nobody has to give us the name because we already got it. <laughs> but the mantras, we don't have them. And they're secret, so you have to get that from the Guru. So that's the, that's where the Diksha lies. So for Bhakti Siddhanta, the second, what we call second initiation, was called the Diksha, Vaishnava Diksha. The first is called Namda, getting the name. So he did this to encourage people to start chanting. And the second one is for deity worship. To this, he also added Vedic Gayatri Om Bhuva Swaha for the men, not the women. So this qualifies you to chant the Vedas. Which we don't do, and Gaudiya Mata don't do actually, <laughs> but it qualifies to chant the Vedas. So why did he do this? Since we don't chant the Vedas anyway, huh? mm -hmm. to show to the smarter Brahmins of the time that the Vaishnava who is duly initiated with the Krishna mantra is superior to the Brahma and is qualified to do deity worship, because the smartas were arguing that the low class. Gaudiya Vaishnavas, who are not Brahmanas, should not worship deities or Shalagrava. So he said, no, if you're a Vaishnava, you are qualified. So therefore, a Vaishnava is superior to the Brahmana. So therefore, he gave him mantra to qualify them as Brahmana. So that's, that's the technical reason why we get this Vedic Gayatri added on there, to counteract the criticism of the Smartas which is no longer a real criticism. They're no longer smart as criticizing us anymore, especially in the Western world. <laughs> now, in ISKCON, we go a little transformation here. And, of course, Bhakti Siddhanta also made statements like this. Okay, chanting Hare Krishna is real initiation. So, Prabhupada calls this first initiation, where you get your name, and you start chanting seriously, and you take vows, you get your beads, and then he also introduced a fire sacrifice here also, which is non-Vedic. Uh, this other sacrifice here is actually a Vedic sacrifice called Upurayam Sanskar, which is very famous because all the children in South India who are Brahmins, Chapters of Vaishyas, when they're five years old, they hire the Brahmin priest and he chants all these mantras, whatever, from the Vedas, and they get their thread. So it's a common ceremony with Vedic reference to it, chanting Vedic mantras. However, in Iskand, we don't use Vedic mantras at all here uh, in the fire sacrifice. We just say, Namal Vishnu Padaya, that's it, Swaha. Huh? So it's a little different, but it's a Vedic, it's a, sacri a non Vedic sacrifice, we'll call it. Then we have the second initiation. This is this is the same as the Gaudiya Mat, where we have the mantra, Didi mantra, and then you're qualified for Didi worship, Archana. Plus, we have the Brahminical aspect. We also get the Brahmin thread, etc. Difference, women also get the mantra, uh, which qualifies them as chapter Vedas also. Yes. And uh, another difference is we do a fire sacrifice, but it's also a non vedic sacrifice. It's not the Upanai and Sanskar, in other words. So we find a little bit of a modification here taking place. So in this process, we see that the whole initiation has become a little more complicated than the traditional one, where you get the mantra and that's it or the mantra and the name. So we get uh, all sorts of ceremonies and fire sacrifices and everything, vows, and then plus we get added into a Brahminical initiation there also. It was a little more complex for people. So naturally people have a little difficulty understanding what initiation is because it's got so many elements now. And uh, the result is that what's called Diksha, this whole ceremony becomes more prominent for people. It's a visible thing. And so the Diksha Guru also becomes more prominent than the Shiksha Guru because we have all these things <laughs> happening all around the Diksha Guru. Yeah. Even though the real essence of the Diksha is the mantras here, which are not our main sadhana. Yeah. And 
we have a Brahma Gayatri here, which is also not our main sadhana. So some of these things are not even, we can say, the essential part of our diksha, but nevertheless, the whole thing becomes a diksha, the guru, the diksha guru becomes emphasized. And the first initiation becomes much more prominent than the second initiation for everyone, even though generally they take both. And we call it Harinam Diksha, that's a common term now we use. Even though we say technically it's more Shiksha than Diksha. So consequently, we have all of these elements focusing on a Diksha Guru. Uh, Harinam, vows, rituals, Shiksha, Deity Mantra, Brahmana Diksha, all going through the Diksha Guru. So he gets a very great prominence. So what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, of course, uh, as we see in Chaitanya Shabbat, Diksha Guru, Diksha Guru should be treated equally. But nevertheless, we're giving this great prominence to the Diksha Guru. And uh, practically speaking, for many Diksha Gurus, most of the Shiksha is done by other people. persons, not the Diksha Guru. But the Diksha Guru gets all the credit and all the respect, etc. So we can say this, this improper respect because the work is done by one but and <laughs> the Diksha Guru gets all the credit. Uh, and of course, Shiksha is a major factor in the development of a person in order to get initiation. So the Shiksha Guru should be given credit if he's done all the work. Another aspect of what's wrong with the Diksha Guru become more prominent as it ultimately the Diksha Guru, uh, we could say, overshadows even Shiva Prabhupada. As far as worship, respect, dedication uh, in the lives of the disciples of any particular Guru. And, of course, we're one generation, two generations, three generations down the line. And then if the Diksha Gurus are most prominent, then Prabhupada's like ten generations back, he becomes a minor figure completely. In, in, in this whole Aparam for us. So it's very dangerous. Yeah. So the Diksha Guru becomes prominent, and the whole the rest of the, <laughs> the, the founder of Charity has a very little role to play in the lives of the disciples. So, of course, uh, GBCs try to counteract this to some degree. Whether laws and words have any effect is another thing. <laughs> At least they make statements. ISKCON members shall be trained to place their faith, trust, and allegiance first and foremost in the founder of Charya, who is the preeminent Shikshi Guru for every member of ISKCON. Shiro Prabhupada to be worshipped through his words, his murti, his picture, and his devotees. So this is actually the ISKCON law now. But then how do, do, do the disciples of Gurus really follow this or not? <laughs> They're probably not. The Shikshi Guru is still the one that comes first. So, of course, the, the GBC is trying to, to give more emphasis to the Prabhupada. One of the reasons, of course, was our gratitude to the Father. Another, of course, is because of unity of Iskhan. We have many, many gurus, and if disciples are dedicated to their guru, what is their dedication to Iskhan or to Shri Prabhupada? Much less. So, therefore, we get a very diverse movement with lots of centers of loyalty, but no, no unity at all. So by having uh, emphasis on Prabhupada, we get much more unity within our society. And in 2013, we have another statement. All members of ISKCON for all generations are encouraged to seek shelter of Srila Prabhupada. All members of ISKCON are entitled and encouraged to have a personal relationship with Srila Prabhupada through his books, teaching, service, and his ISKCON society. So here we get another element, not just the books, teaching, service, and whatever he established, but also personal relationship should be there as well. But people will say, well, I can't surrender to so many people, you know, this is, I can surrender one person, but how do I surrender everybody? Here's a statement from Krishna Bhajananarta. The father is like the guru, his older and younger brothers are also gurus, but the father of one's father, or a great relative, worthy of greater respect, is also a guru, but his worship should be doubled out of the father. This is well known among virtuous people. So we're talking to the guru as God or like God, etc., directly Bhagavan, etc. But that will apply not only to the Diksha Guru, but to the Shiksha Gurus. And to the founder guru, then we have to give double, triple, whatever respect. 
because he also is not different from God. So all of them we say, okay, give great respect, uh, don't uh, disrespect it anyway, don't see them as material bodies, Let's, uh, see them as directly supreme Lord, but nevertheless, we do have a gradation there as well. So we do have this whole Quran process that we're going through a shiksha line, uh, and we're emphasizing the Shiksha Guru line as being the line of conveying the Shakti of the Lord and Bhakti Shakti, and not the Diksha, the Shiksha line is doing this. So, how is that spiritual Shakti uh, from the Lord originally coming to devotees? How does it manifest? So, for most people, it comes to the Diksha Guru. How does it come to the Diksha Guru? So the Diksha Guru has a ceremony. So it's coming to the ceremony, such as the fire sacrifice. Is that how the Shakti is transmitted from the Diksha Guru to the disciple through the fire sacrifice? But as I said, the fire sacrifice wasn't even there, even for Bhakti Siddhanta. That's introduced recently. So it wasn't even there. And Gaudi Alai didn't have it before at all. So it can't be a major factor uh, of transmitting Shakti or whatever. Uh, uh, of course, somehow, <laughs> we get uh, we attach great importance to these things, and if people are asked, uh, if you've got initiated, okay, what was the most impressive element of your initiation ceremony? What will they say? I am sacrifice! <laughs> Even though it was never there before, you know, so... We're shifting our emphasis on, you know, what, what's important in Diksha or Shiksha or whatever uh, to things which are, say, uh, modern things that came in. Huh? Uh, is it spiritual name? So yes, then people say, okay, I got a spiritual name now, so they attach it with a lot of importance to that also. Of course, sometimes we see that the spiritual name was actually chosen by somebody else. Prabhupada also gave his disciples, say, okay, you choose the names, and then Prabhupada just gave the names to them. So, again, it's not always a spiritual master personally choosing your name, you know. Is it through receiving the beads? Is sometimes somebody else is giving out the beads also? <laughs> is it through the Diksha Mantras? And you would say, yes, it is, in one sense, because that's the Diksha, and it's not different from Krishna also. But, as I said, this is a minor factor in our sadhana. We're chanting Hare Krishna, not that. So, is it through Hare Krishna Mantras? We say, yes. But they were chanting Hare Krishna long before we even get Hari Nam, our first initiation. So, it's not exclusively the Diksha Guru that gives you Hari Dham, transmit Shakti that way also. Is it through teachings? Yes, of course, we can say it's through teachings. But again, it's not only the Diksha Guru who's giving you teachings. So many people are giving you teachings. Is it through personal presence? Yes, but so many other Shikshu Gurus there are personally present also. So, what? how, how is it the Diksha Guru special for transmitting Shakti of Krishna to a disciple? Is it any of these or all of these or what? Oh yeah, all our means of transmitting bhakti, obviously. But, and how do we relate this to Srila Prabhupada? We have Krishna giving inspiration to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada distributes his shakti to his disciples who become gurus, and they uh, uh, distribute also. And meanwhile, we have Prabhupada establishing teachings, his books. He establishes a system, chanting 16 rounds. He establishes a ceremony for first initiation, second initiation. He gave the original Diksha Mantras, which were handed down by the disciples. So definitely, he's got a role to play functionally in terms of uh, all the processes for uh, spiritual advancement that we have, definitely. But nevertheless, all of these are coming through a person. And usually that person ends up to be the Diksha Guru in the eyes of most people. Though, as I say, it's also coming to Shiksha Guru as well, but most people put the emphasis on the Diksha Guru here. And then they also have the personal presence of the Diksha Guru. They don't have, they don't say, well, Prabhupada's not here, so you know, we take shelter of a, a living person, so I take shelter of the Diksha Guru. So in this way, the Diksha Guru becomes again very, very prominent in the life of the disciple. But the whole uh, say, 
the problem is how are we going to shift a lot of the emphasis from uh, Shikshiguro or Shikshiguro to Prabhupada as the preeminent Shikshiguro, as the founder of Charya, except how we do that in the future or even now, because there is a problem that Prabhupada is less prominent. But as, as time goes on in the future, we do have to safeguard the eminent, prominent position of the Prabhupada somehow or other in the lives of all the future devotees. How do we do that? Uh, so, of course, we make statements. GBC makes statements. Prabhupada is the preeminent Shikshu Guru. Uh, he's, you know, uh, he, you should have a personal relationship through Prabhupada, through his books, and, uh, teachings, etc. Statements are there, but still. And we have a disciple course also. But nevertheless, people go back and they put everything on the Shikshu Guru. <laughs> because if they want a living person or whatever. So a lot of things get stuck back on the Shikshu Guru, quite of all the words of the GDC or whatever. So we do have a problem of how to solve this problem of putting problem in the center, making a, a living personality for all people in the future. Now we're only two generations removed. Yeah, one or two generations removed. What happens 20 generations from now? Right? The, 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 you know, so the influence of problem gets much weaker. So how do we you know, keep the prominence of problem uh, into the future? So that, that's a problem for everyone to contemplate. We, we can think of many things. Uh, we can take Prabhupada as a primary shelter for everyone, as the ultimate deliverer. Though some of our spiritual masters now are saying to the disciples, I'm not the real, you know, I, I'm not the real deliverer you Krishna as Prabhupada is doing it. So I'm just his instrument, which isn't very nice. We're the mediums. I'm the medium for delivering you. And then Prabhupada's the main medium, and then he takes you to Krishna. And so in this way, we get more emphasis on Srila Prabhupada. We can introduce ceremonies to make Prabhupada the ultimate asraya for all the devotees, and, you know, when they, they start chanting Hare Krishna. Just as we have ceremonies for Diksha. Have a ceremony to, uh, for Prabhupada to make him the asraya guru or whatever for all the devotees. So these are primary shelter, etc. Uh, there could be many other mean things we could do. You can always think of this. So that's why it's like a question mark. What, what to do is a problem. We have to solve this problem now rather than in the future. Because definitely as time goes on, the tendency is to, that this position will get weaker and weaker. So we do have to do something about it. Okay. So, how do we keep the Prabhupada in the lives of the devotees as the uh, uh, most significant factor of inspiration? Like as if you're the living guru. When Prabhupada is alive, there was no uh, doubt about his influence on everybody, right? but now that he's not personally present, then it becomes questionable. And in the future, it'll be his influence is weaker, weaker, and weaker. But we would, don't want that to happen. He's the founder of Acharya of our society, so we have to keep him as the main figure somehow or other. So the question is how to do that? How are we going to do that? And we, we're going to have to do something about it. Right? Here's some uh, quotations. Uh, uh, the spiritual master should be considered to be directly supreme lord because he gives transcendental knowledge for enlightenment. One should know the acharya as myself and never disrespect him in any way. One should not envy him thinking an ordinary man, for he's a representative of all the demigods. So he's already shown you. Then we have something like this. A devoted disciple of a spiritual master would rather die with the spiritual master than fail to execute the spiritual master's mission. So most devotees would read this to the Dikshu Guru, so I have to sacrifice everything to the Dikshu Guru. Here, it doesn't say that, it says spiritual master. <laughs> so, how to give that, the devotees, this uh, statement and apply that to Srila Prabhupada when they think of this as a Dikshu Guru? How to do that? That's, that's the problem for us. Uh, how, how to make Prabhupada the center of everything. Uh, and, and so instead of putting the effort of Dikshu Guru, how do we put the emphasis on Srila Prabhupada as the living guru for everyone? No? Okay, any question? Uh, how, how, what do you think about 
removing the high ceremony would affect in the importance of the Diksha Guru in the Buddhist psyche. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, nobody asked Prabhupada why the fire sacrifice was there. Everyone just, he did it. Everyone else followed after that and did it. So we don't really know because nobody asked him. My, my supposition, but maybe I'm uh, faulty one, I don't know, <laughs> is that maybe he got inspired because he saw the fire sacrifice for the Upanayana ceremony for the giving the Brahman mantra and the Gaudiya Mat, and that's where the fire sacrifice, because we don't see it there in the Gaudiya line as part of the Diksha at all. But it, it, With the second initiation, when you get your Brahma Gayatri, Swaha, he carried out the Upanayana samskar, in which one becomes a Brahmachari. So all of the, even the elder grihasas sit down at the fire and they go through the samskar and become a brahmachari for one day, I guess. And they hold a thunder and they're supposed to get a deer skin and all this stuff and chant the mantras to become a brahmachari and <laughs> do all this, you know. So obviously the women would become brahmachari so they would participate in the ceremony, therefore he didn't give them the mantra, the brahma gayatri. So that's, that's where the, the only fire sacrifice I can see. Fire sacrifices are not forbidden. And they are done in Panchratha, uh, in the Panchasamskar. Uh, if you look at different chasters, even in the uh, uh, Parivak Vlas, there's a, a, a Diksha ceremony, and they do a, a, a fire sacrifice also. So it's not, it's not, there's nothing scripturally there, but not like we do it. And uh, definitely in the Odia Sampar, they didn't follow that also, as far as I know. They didn't follow the fire sacrifice. So if we take it out, one sec, uh, we could, because as I said, the essential part of Diksha is getting the Diksha mantras, uh, and of course, uh, so you could take it out. Of course, you can even take out the Brahma guy, because that's not essential either, but it may cause a revolution in this gun because we're changing everything gave us, so you know, there's a little problem to change things at this point. All right, Krishna. All right, Krishna. Well, Maharaj, thank you so much. I attended your talk yesterday and again today. Again. <laughs> you emphasize, make it very clear that Srila Prabhupada has a preeminent position yeah. within his own. If all others make the same emphasis and minimize their undertaking and promote it through the Prabhupada, would we have any problem at all? In your, among gurus, you're saying? Yeah. Uh, if they were to do it repeatedly to their disciples, repeatedly, 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 it probably would have an effect. But the problem, as I said, is that generally, uh, I say disciples, uh, become attached to this idea of the Diksha Guru as the ultimate deliverer and that all the statements in the scriptures that we see, they, they apply that to the Diksha Guru. So they get some sort of projection on that Guru, which kind of clouds their vision, so to speak. <laughs> so whatever the Guru says, they, they still go for this other thing, you know. So they don't quite hear that unless he keeps repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. You mentioned yesterday yeah. that in the Madhvas Sampradaya, at least, mm. the father gives his son the mantras for uh, worship and so on. So effectively, there is no Diksha Guru, but only the Shiksha teaching of Madhvacharya. Well, I, I don't know about the Madhva Sampradaya, if the father gives or not. He that. does. He does, okay. I don't know about that. But, so you meant, okay. okay. Is he giving the Brahma Gayatri or is yes. he giving Diksha Mantras? Brahma Gayatri, definitely the father gives to the son, yes. so that's, but that's different. That's Vedic. But my point is, within that Sampradaya, yeah. the Diksha Guru, I don't think there's any such thing as the Diksha Guru. So isn't it, and several times you were saying with the first sacrifice and so on, yeah. that Iskon has a particular culture. Mm -hmm. Since most of us were not from Vaishnava families before we came to Iskon, mm -hmm. is it not that we have learned this culture of glorifying the spiritual master? From Iskon, what we've been in Iskon, so isn't it just a question of relearning what you're emphasizing? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm quoting from Chitanjali Tower, the Shiksha Guru, Diksha Guru, equal, but 
So if we learn that properly, then we understand. But then, as I said, most people take these statements and any statement about spiritual master, they'll apply only to the Diksha Guru. <laughs> so in other words, their, their, let's say, their vision and their knowledge becomes channeled towards Diksha Guru. They see everything in terms of Diksha Guru, in spite of the fact that many statements are just going to say spiritual master. So it could be Prabhupada, it could be Shiksha Guru, but they take it all as Diksha Guru. So somehow their vision becomes a little distorted. Maharaj, I love all of your writings and all of your books, and especially your speaking. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to speak more and make this <laughs> sound <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much. It's been quite wonderful. Uh, a technical question. So there was a point where some devotees who received like first initiation from Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. And then of course second from somebody, somebody else. else. Yeah. Who's their diction guru? <laughs> <laughs> so is that the question? It is. Well, yeah, because uh, as we see Prabhupada says at one place, first initiation more important, another place says second initiation is real initiation. So if you've got scriptural diksha, the one who gives the mantra, the Krishna mantra, would be the second initiation. He's the diksha guru as such. But as we see, even Bhakti Siddhanta also said that, you know, uh, namasarta, that person who takes shelter of the holy name is more better than the one who takes shelter of the mantra. So therefore, Prabhupada also says, Harinam uh, initiation is more important. So, like that. And then the first initiation also goes initiation. So, it's a little ambiguous, so we could say that the first initiation is the real guru in one sense, though technically speaking, second would be the Diksha guru, but we put more emphasis on first. An observation, it seems that the idea of taking the vows and doing the, the fire sacrifice, yeah. it's, it's making a promise. Yeah. They're saying, I will do this, I will yeah. follow yeah. the training principles, yeah. I will chant these 16 rounds a yeah. day, yeah. which of course, also becomes a double-edged sword because now I've made a promise, yeah. and if I don't follow through on that promise, yeah. Yeah. now I've also created an offense. <coughs> yeah. So that, what's, the, what's the question? Well, it's an observation, and I would maybe you could speak on that. Well, yeah, a vow is very important. Of course, one could take a vow without doing initiation also for a shiksha guru. One could take a vow also, so you could apply the same thing there. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the shiksha guru accepts, okay, <laughs> then you have an obligation, the shiksha guru has an obligation, and mm -hmm. so it could operate. So it's not a distinguishing factor of diksha, but generally we don't do anything for shiksha guru, so then it all ends up with the diksha guru getting <laughs> the obligation to, you know, mm -hmm. up, you know, deliver the disciple, the disciple to follow him. Uh, so this puts more emphasis on the diksha guru again. Prabhupada so uh, did mention his writings and he encouraged his disciples to become initiating gurus. Mm. If it might have been, but I can confirm it. He did mention like that in his writings that mm. his disciples should initiate. Yeah. And 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 we'll have a lot of disciples initiating, Prabhupada's disciples. Uh, now, the situation is that we will, as mentioned, the situation and position of Prabhupada is not lost or not maintained. So, would it not be a possible solution that, that, that the disciples initiate on behalf of Srila Prabhupada? Something like a citizen? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, many, many, I think many gurus do that. They say, I'm initiating on behalf of Srila Prabhupada. As I said, you could, you, they could say, I'm just the medium for Prabhupada. He's the actual deliverer, or he's actually taking you to Krishna. I'm just his servant. So, I think many Diksha gurus already state that to the disciples in initiation time. They do that. So there's nothing wrong with that, it's pretty good. And that helps, of course, put the emphasis back on Shiva Prabhupada. Uh, of course, the other thing is that the Ritviks, <laughs> the Prabhupada is the only Diksha Guru, everybody else is this nothing else. So, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, what is it, the Acharya? The uh, something Acharya, or whatever. Uh, anyway, anyway, Prabhupada's a Diksha Guru, and he's the actual initiator, they take him as the initiator. So that, that's their system, where they put great emphasis on Prabhupada because we call him initiator, he gives the mantra, whatever. But then of course the problem is that who gives the name? <laughs> Prabhupada cannot choose the name now. <laughs> so there's a, there's a few problems there also. Or he can't chant on the beads also. Uh, so, you know, you know he, he's Diksha Guru, but really he, he's doing. And he doesn't accept the disciple also. How do we know he accepts him even? So the problems are there also. 
What's more important? Well, obviously for us, Harinam is the Yuga Dharma, mm -hmm. and among all the different processes of bhakti, this is the, the most prominent, powerful one. So chanting the holy name is the most powerful process. And uh, Archana is not rejected, but it's secondary to that. If you don't chant Hare Krishna into Archana, as Bhaktisiddhanta and Sarasati said, it's useless. It has no power. So it also depends on Harinam, in most cases, for us at least. Okay, if we've been doing your So Harinam is the most important. Krishna, right? Elaborating on the grand, grand, great grand disciple, if you put a fourth and fifth generation, yeah. we put in faith in Sila Prabhupada. Yeah. And do not have that much emphasis on your initiative group. Yeah. So then, how different we are with the difference? What's the difference? Yeah. Uh, well, the, what we're fixing today, Prabhupada, is the Diksha Guru. Here we have a Diksha Guru, but we're saying make him a little less prominent and give more prominence to Prabhupada as the preeminent Shikshu Guru. So they're calling him the Diksha Guru. He gives the mantra, he gives the name, he gives this and that. Though technically he's not doing that, somebody else is doing a lot of this. But they call him the Diksha Guru, the giver of the mantra. But we're saying, no, the Diksha Guru is giving you that mantra, personally. So that, that's the difference. As far as putting emphasis in Prabhupada, we both agree with that. With the Rishis, we also agree that Prabhupada should be the most important. We should give him the most credit. We should think of him as the ultimate deliverer. We don't, we don't object to that at all. Terminologies, we differ. I think maybe one more because we're going over time. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Are they, do you regard them as a Are they, should regard them as a personal Your managers you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, I didn't bring this up here. I spoke once in my previous seminars about the, the, the managerial line and the spiritual line. So the Diksha Guru is a spiritual line, and then we have the managerial line, which may be temple presidents, regional secretaries, GBC, etc. That's another line. And if the temple president is a good temple president, he also acts as a shikshu guru and gives you some teachings, I hope, <laughs> and he trains up devotees. <laughs> so he, yeah, he's acting as a shikshu guru of sorts. You may want to, you may not want to accept him as the primary shikshu guru in the sense he's equal to the diksha guru. He may be not on the same status. In fact, he may be a disciple of your diksha guru, so it may be a problem also. But nevertheless, we have to accept him in some sort as a a teacher as a Shiksha Guru and give him some respect for whatever guidance he's giving, etc. So yeah, we, we do have to accept those managers. Others may not be managers at all, but they may be giving counsel and or Shiksha, etc. So then we have to give respect to those also. Huh? Not equal to them? Well, uh, 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 there may be a Shiksha Guru who you get great valuable instructions from or inspiration from. Uh, and, and maybe you don't even see your Diksha Guru more than two hours a year or every several years. <laughs> or maybe you don't even personally talk to him for many years, who knows. Uh, so in that case, that Shikshu Guru may be a more prominent influence than Diksha Guru, in which case, of course, you can equal respect to that, that, that Shikshu Guru as a Diksha Guru. I think we have to end here because we're the end on time. Somebody else is coming in here. Last oh, this is the last thing. Okay, so we can have a few more questions, I guess. Thank you, Maharaj. My, my question is, uh, Mahaprabhu um, gave instructions to Sanatana uh, Goswami, after which he has compiled the... Hari yeah. So then, why did he send so much dear emphasis on, 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 on Diksha, if Mahaprabhu gave him the uh -huh. yeah. Well, if you look at Hari Bhakti Vilas, uh, at least half of that whole book is on deity worship. <laughs> so to do the deity worship, you have to take a shot. <laughs> so a lot of it is deity worship. 
we find a whole uh, 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 section on you know installing deity. Then we have a section on you know uh, preliminaries of deity worship, picking the flowers, and then on the procedures of deity worship, offering the different items, the purification of the items, uh, different ceremonies also like Buddha Sudi, etc. All in relation to deity worship. So at least uh, eight chapters of the whole book are dedicated to deity worship. So therefore, within that, he also gives the and he talks about the Diksha mantras, and then he talks about Diksha. So that's why the Diksha gets some emphasis there because of the uh, deity worship aspect. Lord, so. we have built um, prominent objects also in the Gaudi Satsana. Like somebody could say that uh, building the Vishnu Room of Krishna on the way of Sutras, yeah. uh, somebody could say that Vishnu is the one of the big commentators from Bhagavatam. Also, Jiva Swami compiled the Satsana. Uh, uh, so, what, what is the position of Prabhupada with respect to the previous operation? Do we give the same position and worship all the previous Acharyas, or is it more prominent than even? You mean Prabhupada and the previous Acharyas? Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we take Prabhupada as the deliverer of the message of the previous Acharyas. In other words, he doesn't deviate from their message, so he's delivering their message. Unfortunately, he didn't. Translate and comment on all the works of course he said our, we want to do this, 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 and this, but he never got around to that. In fact, he didn't figure he didn't finish the whole Bible with them. He got to the fourteenth chapter of the tenth canto and that was it. But he had ambitions to go to the Mahabharata, Ramayana, Madhana Sutras, etc. etc. So anyway, it wasn't complete in other words. But obviously, uh, whatever he's got us, but we can say the Bible to itself contains everything, so from that we can go backwards and we can interpret everything else in terms of Thank you. Maharaj, mm. the, when the Ritviks are saying, okay, Prabhupada's the only one you know, who can deliver like that, but well, Prabhupada said that when he, he referred to us as his disciples, he said, actually, you're you're my spiritual master. I'm simply, on his behalf, I'm initiated. Yeah. You know, so it, it seems that, you know, in our lives, it's just a confession that each guru is handing back to the previous yeah. and honoring them, yeah. that that it's a natural thing, and, and especially Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. The preeminent, he's and he truly yeah. is, and he's the savior of the universe. Yeah. The, uh, there is really no conflict. Yeah. The, the, it, it seems... Yeah, anyway, well, I think maybe it's just an emotional attachment or something. So that the, the guru, that this guru here is my guru, and you know, it's all because of maybe sentimental also, and maybe projection of one's own material, uh, I don't know, weaknesses. <laughs> so we take shelter of somebody to, you know, uh, like a, a father or a mother or whatever, we're taking shelter of them. So, and they're an immediate person. So that's part of the reason, maybe also, that there's some material. Projections that are taking place as well, so that the the Diksha Guru gets such a prominent place in the life of the disciple. But it is natural that obviously each Guru he he, he doesn't give himself credit. He's he's giving to his Guru and the previous Gurus. It's it's, it's natural that as uh, Sanatan Goswami says, the more advanced you become, the more humble you become. And so that the most advanced devotee is who? The Kaldis, Radharani. <laughs> they're the most humble. <laughs> they consider that the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant. They're like the lowest. They, they think of themselves the lowest <laughs> and of the highest. So the more you advance, the more you think I'm just you know doing something on behalf of my spiritual master and the previous sorry, I'm not really doing anything. It's natural uh, as part of bhakti. And the higher the bhakti, the more that becomes prominent. And the knowledge itself that's being handed. So when one, it's not even the personality so much, it's honoring the knowledge that's being transmitted. So these individuals who are being honored as guru, you know, one can look at them and say, oh, I see this ball and that ball. But that knowledge that they're, that they're giving, it's, yeah. it's the position and, and the knowledge itself is of Krishna consciousness. It, that in and of itself deserves to be honored. Right. Yeah, in other words, uh, we have the idea you should see the guru's body as material, etc., etc. So maybe you get sick or whatever, how we think it's not material. But the idea is we're not supposed to think of that aspect of the guru, but we're speaking of his function. And he's a, a medium or a channel. 
for Krishna Shakti, for the knowledge of Krishna, for the inspiration of Krishna, whatever's coming directly from Krishna, coming down through Acharyas, the Prabhupada, etc. And we're just another medium for that thing. So we honor that Guru as the medium of Krishna Shakti coming through the Prabhupada.